So Gary's going to come up and um, and uh, give us a little talk about research, perils, pitfalls, and pointers. Gary Bunker. Thank you. Okay, can everybody hear me okay? No. Yes. Great, awesome. Just shout out if it goes too quiet. Um, thank you for inviting me here tonight. It's great to be here. Um, I'm going to say I had huge problems with this presentation because this is such a massive area. There is so much to talk about. And my first run at this deck ended up at about 60 odd slides. And I've got 25 minutes to talk. So I, I didn't want to kill anyone. So I, I changed direction. Um, so I'm going to focus tonight really on um, the quant side of things and, and uh, moderated research in particular. I'm going to talk to you about some of the worst things that I've seen and how to avoid them. Um, quick question first of all, out of the room, how many researchers do we have? Hands up if you're a researcher or you do regular research. Okay, great, that's about, about a third. Um, uh, my view, and you can start throwing tomatoes at the end of the presentation, is if you've got CX or UX in your title and you don't talk to users, then you really should be a little bit ashamed. You, you kind of have to be talking to your audience if you're designing anything. That's, that's my view. Um, so it's nice to meet people. Um, at a rough count, and it is a really rough count, I've researched about 7,000 people. So I've been in this field for a while. I talk to people all the time. Uh, and just before I go too much further, I'm just going to let you know, I, I had a change of direction a few years ago uh, in a really short window of time. I lost uh, three family members to um, partic uh, particularly unpleasant conditions and very nearly lost a, a, a child in that same window. And I had a real crisis of conscience of what I was doing and, and in the end decided, you know what, I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing, but I'm going to do it in a space where people need it the most. So since then I've really focused on aged care and disability and in sectors where people really need the help the most when it comes to those digital experiences, um, which is sometimes really tough, but it's also meant I've met some of the best people I think I've ever met on the planet. So it's, it's a great space to work. Um, but now that I've brought the mood down, I've got to back up again. So um, what's, what's the connection between these four things? Anyone? Figure it out. Pleasure. I'm going to say questionable research is the thing. Um, so Colgate in the early 80s decided that um, uh, they were going to take frozen food and that people who bought their toothpaste from Colgate would be more than happy to buy frozen food from them. Uh, the research said, yep, yeah, they'll do it. Um, the the uh, people said no. Um, everybody knows the story of New Coke, right? Yeah. So they did the research. They said, yeah, it's awesome. Tastes much better. Um, horrendous failure when it hit the market. Uh, the one at the top right there is Mazagran, which was uh, Starbucks. Now, I think here they were kind of ahead of the market, really. But they partnered with Coke and took a, a caffeine, a coffee-flavoured soft drink to market. And again, their market research said people were ready for that, um, but unfortunately not. And the last one in the bottom corner there, my favourite. Uh, so I wouldn't say this was bad research per se, um, but new scientists reported in April of this year uh, that apparently male fruit flies enjoy it when they orgasm. <laughs> now, that could be great research, but exactly what do we do with that information? So, <laughs> well, maybe female fruit flies can use it in some way, I don't know. But. Okay, so if you do bad research, what happens? I think probably everybody knows potentially what can go wrong. Um, the first one is you can build a folly. You can build something that you get out there and just it just flops, it just fails. And I don't know if anybody ever had the pleasure of seeing the Amstrad emailer. Anybody see one? Okay, they were fantastic. I mean, this was, this was a product where they decided that email was coming and they were going to get ahead of the curve by putting a small email-enabled telephone in everybody's home. Uh, and the, the bit at the bottom, which I absolutely love, uh, you have no chance of operating this unit unless you refer to the instruction manual. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, unsurprisingly, um, it, it disappeared within uh, a couple of years and didn't, didn't survive. The next one is the missed opportunity. So, 78, the, the Sony Walkman arrived and the world changed and everybody had one and they were awesome. And for many years, they ruled the marketplace. And then MP3 players came along and for anybody who's younger who maybe doesn't know, the iPod wasn't the first MP3 player. Um, but they own the space, absolutely own space now. And the, the reason for that was that everybody missed the gold in the opportunity there, 
which wasn't so much the player, it was more the marketplace, it was the selling of the music. So if you don't do the right research, if you don't have the vision put into what you're doing, you can miss the, the big opportunity. And for anybody who, apologise for anybody who loves uh, Google Wave, but the same thing. I mean, it's a great product, it had a great concept behind it, the implementation was pretty crappy, uh, and eventually it, it disappeared from the market. So th the risk if you do poor research uh, is that you can lose everything. And that's something which unfortunately I see on a regular basis. Um, just recently I was working with a startup organisation who had done some pretty questionable research and they'd spent all their money and they weren't selling and they were just heading down the tubes and th they're now gone. Uh, and it was all down to the fact that the research they did just wasn't the right type of research. So, um, pitfalls to avoid. Um, the first and biggest problem that I see and that creeps up all the time is not knowing what problem it is you're trying to solve. If you do a piece of research, if you just go out there and we're just going to talk to our customers, well that's great, you're going to have some awesome conversations, but what are you going to come back with? You need to know what problem you're trying to solve, who you're trying to solve it for, um, and where that correlates to your product. The next problem is setting out knowing what you're going to find. And this is a common one, I see this all the time. People will say, well we know that customers want these things, we're going to go out there and talk to them and find out. And surprise, surprise, you'll find out that they, you'll learn exactly what it is that you think you're going to learn because your bias will come into the research around there. Working with too small a sample size is, is the next problem. If you start off with a really small sample size, I've got a telco at the moment that's working with me and they came to me the other day and they said, look, we've taken this brand new product to market. Um, we want you to go and telephone five people and find out what they want. And I said, well, yeah, that's great. And you'll be selling to five people if that's all you do. You, you, you know, you, you're not going to find what, how many segments do you have? And they had about 13 different segments that they wanted to look at. Um, where do they want to sell? They wanted to sell across regional Australia. Not just regional New South Wales, regional Australia. Um, and so you have a sample size of five and, and you're in all sorts of hot water. And the next one is being prepared to change instantly. And again, this is something I see quite regularly. People will talk to one or two people and then go, great, look, we've heard that people don't like it. We're going to change direction. We're going to start changing the product immediately. And you'll get into all sorts of hot water if you do that. So the first thing that I'll say in terms of the, the pointers here is define the goal. Any kind of research, you need to know what it is that you're setting out to find out. Know who it is you're going to find it from. Don't aim at everybody. Make sure you've got a very defined target. You, if you design for everyone, you're then you're designing for no one, so, and, and everybody in the room knows that. Uh, so define what that audience is and what the, the research goal is. Set the scope and the sample size, and there are some great ways to do that. Uh, and I think even Eric has a tool that can help with that. Uh, so you can figure out how to set the size that you should be talking to. Defining the right script is absolutely paramount. So when you have any kind of research, whether it's over the phone or in person, whether it's moderated or, or not, you you have to set the right content into that to learn what you need to learn. Um, I cannot possibly cover all of that in today's session, um, but anybody who wants to know, I can talk about that later on or another time. And the last one, beware bias, and, and I'll talk about that as I go through. So if you do good research, then you're going to be recruiting some people. If you just randomly stop people on the street, then you're not, you're not going to be in the right space. Um, and that's the very first mistake that I often see, is people just grab people and they say, well, we're just going to go and talk to people and, and we're going to find out what they want from us, and that's where we'll go from there. Um, there's, there's an old adage that good UX, good CX, is really like a, a waiter in a restaurant. The job is to go to the customer, find out what they need, bring it back, uh, and make sure that the business uh, presents to that person uh, what they want so that they're, you've got a happy customer. That's your job. Um, but can you imagine any restaurant where the waiter would just go to a random in the restaurant and say, what do you reckon that guy over there wants for dinner? I'll, just, I'll, I'll make that. Um, you can't do that, right? You have to talk to the right person to find out what they need. So uh, you've got to make sure, first of all, that you're talking to the right person. The next mistake I see is talking to the right person at the wrong time. So I'm a father. I was a very actively involved father. I was involved with changing nappies for all the fun that that is. Um, but I haven't changed a nappy in 10 years. Now, you could research me today on the process and on what I need from nappies, I, I'd be the wrong person. Because even though I was then, I'm not now. And the next mistake I see is researching in the wrong place. The context of where someone is using the product is absolutely paramount in terms of how they use the product. So if someone's out on a sports field using a soccer app to, to control the team and to switch people over, 
then there's no point bringing them into an office and sitting them down and saying, just do it here, because you're, you're not going to get the same uh, input, you're not going to get the same learnings from it. Incentive is the next thing. Uh, you need to incentivize people to absolutely the right level. If you don't incentivize people, then the only people who will turn up for the research are the people who are highly invested, the people who love you. And you don't learn too much from that. If you under incentivize, then they'll turn up, you'll find it hard to recruit them, but when they do turn up, they're not going to care that much and they'll do it. They might start resenting you a little bit if it takes more than a few minutes. So you don't learn the most from that. And the other mistake is over incentivizing. If you pay them too much, which is kind of easy to do, then they love you. I mean, if someone said to you, I'll pay you 500 bucks to sit down and, and answer a few questions, and you're like, sure, and when, when do you want to do it again? Of course I'm going to sit down and do that. Um, and, and then what you get is a lot of positivity and just how much your system is awesome, and you're not learning what you need to learn. Time frame is the last one for me. Um, I lost count of the number of times I've been asked to kick up a piece of research, and they say, look, we want it to happen next week. Well. We haven't even defined who it is you want to talk to yet, but let alone getting the recruiters who are going to have to get on the phone and have to line these people up. It takes time. Uh, if you try and leave it too, uh, too late, it's incredibly difficult to get good people in the room at the right time. Equally, if you start too early, if you recruit too soon, you'll recruit people, but then they fall out because other things come along, they get busy, uh, life changes, and suddenly they're not free on the day. And the last thing around timing is don't put your sessions too close together. If you have sessions banged right up against the other, you don't have time to think, you don't have time to breathe, it's like a production line, you're racing people through, and you just don't get the, the good results that you need from it. And the, the shame of that is you can be spending a huge amount of time and effort and cost getting these people in the room, and they've got these really valuable things that you can see that they want to tell you, and you're just going, yep, that's great, thanks, bye, and they're out the door because the next person's turned up. So you just leave yourself that gap in between. Um, everybody knows what a screener is. Um, hopefully. So the screener is just a way, a set of questions that make sure you have the right person in the room. Uh, anybody who wants to see an example of a screener, if you haven't used one, I can, I can provide one to you. Uh, but the, the key thing of a screener is it should avoid giving away who it is you want to talk to. Uh, so just today, I had a client who had a problem where the, they had handed out a screener. They wanted to talk to year 12 students who were ready to go on to university. Um, so the first question was, do you have a year 12 student who is ready to go to university because we're paying $80 for some research? Now, how surprising is it that everybody who got that said, yes, I have a year 12 student who's ready to go to university. Sure, can I have my $80, please? So you want to make sure that the screener pulls out the people who don't really fit. Um, the second one is making sure you've got the right person, and the ideal target is actually not a user. It's a potential user. It's somebody who hasn't used this thing, doesn't know this thing, wants to use this thing or will use this thing, but potentially is using a competitive product or hasn't yet been introduced to it. Because that person will tell you so much about the initial experience, the learning experience, and as they transition through into being a customer, you'll learn so much more from them. If you test someone who's already seen the system or the interface or the app, then they've already learned how it works and they get around it. Uh, cut out any professionals, and by that I mean people who work in the industry. I would be the worst possible person to sit in a user test room because um, I'd start critiquing everything that they were doing. Um, you don't want those, you don't want the extremes, you don't want the piece of people who love it, you don't want the people who absolutely hate it, you don't want the people who use it once every three years, you don't want the people who use it once every five minutes. You want the people in the middle who use it on a normal basis. Um, give yourself a week or two to recruit. Uh, the gap between them and the last thing I'd say is consider using a professional recruiter. I know it's cost, but they will save you so much pain and effort when it comes to lining up those people and they'll make sure they're recruited right. When you do get them in the room, um, the worst thing you can do is bring them to your own offices. Uh, I, I know that sometimes that's the only thing you can do. I know sometimes it's, it's beyond your control. But if you do, uh, think about it this way. If someone said to you, come to my home, I'm gonna show you pictures of my baby and then you tell me what you think. Anybody brave enough to start saying the nose is a bit wonky and <laughs> you, you're gonna, people who walk in that room are going to say, yeah, it's beautiful, it's great, yeah, it's fantastic. Um, watch out for noisy locations. So uh, I've done some research previously where we had to do testing on, um, on the shop floor, as it were, so in uh, the entrance of Ikea was probably the worst. Uh, in the entrance to Ikea, they wanted us to stop people and talk to them as they came through. Now, it was great because they were in context, 
but the number of screaming children who were going in and out of Ikea, there must be a horrendous thing going on in there because they weren't happy coming out. Um, so, and you're trying to run a session with that happening and the, the person's looking the other way and they're distracted. Second degree session. Yeah, 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 something else going on there. You also don't want it too interesting. If it's too interesting, if there's too much uh, for them to look at and think about, then they, they get very distracted. So what you really need is uh, no glass walls. Don't, you know, if you've got glass walls and it's in the place that people are walking past and everybody's walking past in the looky-loo and kind of, what are they doing in there? It's very confronting for the person who sat in there, especially if you're recording the session. It makes them feel like they're, you know, they're in a TV or up here, like right now. They don't want to be up there. Um, you can use viewing rooms. Uh, they're, uh, if anybody doesn't know, there are places like city group rooms. They're not the only one. Um, they're, they're pretty good at um, uh, providing everything for you so you can uh, get your research done in there. Nice and quiet. Um, make sure if you're doing it in any other place, Wi-Fi connection and PowerPoints. They're the two things uh, that trip most people up. You, you kind of assume it will be great and then you get in the room and find that, oh, we're using an Optus phone. There's no signal for Optus in there. Um, so make sure you, uh, that your PowerPoints are covered, you've got good access, um, avoid uh, oh and issues, uh, you don't want cables going across the floor, um, nobody wants to get sued. So if, when it gets to facilitating, um, don't forget you've got an ethical responsibility to that participant. Now in my space I see that a lot because we're talking to people about um, having cancer or losing a loved one and sometimes that's very emotional for the person but that can also be true in many other circumstances. Sometimes I've run research on games where you think it's going to be light and fluffy but the person's walked in the room. Um, I had one recently where they had just lost a loved pet and they thought they would be fine but they walked in the room and burst into tears. So you have a responsibility to that person both to their privacy, um, to the way they're treated. Uh, you need to make sure that nobody's going to walk up to them and say anything to them about the research they've just taken part in. Uh, and that's paramount. So do not take that lightly. That's absolutely key. Do no harm for that person. Don't ask them to role play because they'll just imagine a person. If you say, just imagine you want to buy a new Tesla, um, then they'll OK, I imagine there's a guy who wants to buy a new Tesla. He's going to think that's great. And you don't want them doing that. You want them using it uh, as if they were the person. Um, uh, ideally, you want to be actually observing them, not asking them in the first place. Don't interrogate them. Try to have a bit of rapport, but at the same time, you don't want to, to uh, lead them. Now, I've got a whole section on bias, which I'm going to kind of condense because we're running out of time. Uh, confirmation bias is about going in and learning what you already know. Try not to carry that into the room. There's anchor bias, which is where you know that everyone uses mobile. So if anybody says, well, actually, I don't want to use mobile, you tend to exclude that and think, well, no, I, I know if one uses mobile, I'm not going to listen to that. Preference bias, which is really easy to fall into, where you think, I like that guy. There's always one person who walks in and you think, they're really cool. It's usually a, the 80-year-old that flies through with the mobile phone and has the funny stories, and you think, she is gold. I love her. Um, and so you tend to, they, what they say suddenly carries more weight because you like them. Or similarly biased, which is where you think, well, he's like me. He's, he's, a, cool, he's a cool dad like me. Yeah, yeah. Kind of listen to him. So just be aware of those things. Uh, so um, top rules for me, uh, identify and explain at the start what's going on. Tell them they're being recorded. Tell them what their rights are. They can leave. They can stop. If they want to turn the camera off, they can. Let them know they're in control. They'll feel more at ease to, to go forward. Keep questions light. One or two questions per task is great. So they're doing something, and then you ask them a couple of questions, and they're doing something. Not 50 questions, and then they can move on. Probe, don't survey. Talk, talk to me about what happened there. What did you think about that? Don't, don't survey them. How great was that? You know, that's, that's a horrendous question to ask. Try not to agree with them, but try not to disagree with them. Uh, you, you're looking for a balance in the middle. Last two points on this one is the power of silence. There is nothing better than using the power of silence when, you, when you're interviewing someone. Just kind of leaving that gap that's just slightly too uncomfortable until somebody feels that they have to fill it and they'll explain what's going on. And the hanging sentence can be great too. So you think that's... And again, people will take over and finish that for you. So it's, if you get someone not talking too much, it's a great way to, to get some control. Uh, when you're capturing your findings, uh, the biggest mistake I, can, I see in research all the time is people don't capture their findings. They kind of sit there and they watch and they go, wow, that was great. And then at the end of it, you kind of look at what they've got and they've got a few scribbled notes and they've done so little that you think, well, why did you bother? Um, handwritten notes, so post-its are not your friend when it comes to research. You will find scribbled things that make no sense. Uh, you don't want to be doing that. Don't write while the person's in the room because they are thinking always 
what are you writing? And then when you don't write, they're thinking, oh, that was important. Why aren't you writing that now? Um, so it's, you're throwing them out. And the biggest, the biggest one is don't think of solutions at this point. Um, you don't want to be thinking about solutions. And it's so tempting because the problems come up and you think, we can solve that in this way. And you probably can, but don't focus on that because you instantly stop listening to everything else you hear. So skip over that. Um, there are great tools for video, audio, phone, and desktop recording. Simple tools that can, you can pick them up for nothing nowadays. They will plug in, they can record everything in the experience, easy to do. Um, if you can get another room, log from the other room. If you can't, then log it later. So record the sessions and then from your recordings, later on sit down and go through them and find what you can find. Look for the problem and the context, not the solution. Um, docs, Sheets, Excel, there are lots of ways that you can do that. Um, there are also research management tools. Um, one of them I just happened to find by some company, uh, the four I think they're called, uh, is flexux.com.au, um, which is a shameless plug. But if, and, and funnily enough, I went looking for a shameless plug image, and all of the shameless plugs I could find were doing really rude things, so I couldn't, <laughs> couldn't put them up. Um, so, yeah, so um, analyzing your results. Obviously, once you've got all that data, you want to start doing some clever things with it. Um, Key, key mistakes to avoid. Um, don't react to opinion. Opinion changes all the time. People will change their opinion in five minutes. Behavior doesn't change. So you're looking for behavior and needs and, and the desires and what they want from a product, not what they think of it. Um, don't listen for what you want to hear. And this is the biggest mistake I can, I can see that happens all the time, is the one important person at the top comes in, goes down, and sits down for one session. And in that one session, the one person who loved it and says, it's great, it's the best thing I've ever seen that happens. And the guy walks away going, it's fantastic, I love this research, we don't have to change anything. This guy loved it. And you think, yeah, but the other six sessions they couldn't get through at all. So um, you want all of the results in there. Um, you don't want to miss the context of where it happened uh, and the psychology, the, the why behind it is the key thing. So what you're looking for are patterns. You're looking for understanding, not the fact that people went wrong, but why did they go wrong? What drove them to go wrong? And that's, that's the biggest thing that takes some learning and it takes a lot of empathy and a lot of listening and struggling and just looking at those recordings or looking at that person, but it, you'll get there. Look for the impact as well. So did it stop them? Did it confuse them? Did it just derail them for a few seconds? Did they get completely wrong? Did they miss something key? Um, a few takeaways at the end. Um, so, this is something which I'm hoping is not a great shock to many people, but the burger icon is not globally understood. Okay, three horizontal lines does not mean a menu to everyone that I test. So um, even in younger audiences, you'll often find one out of every five or six people will walk in the room and say there's no menu. Um, so it's, it's surprising what isn't commonly known. Search is the same, and, and much more commonly, the logo goes home. Everyone knows the logo goes home, except they don't. So when you test it, you'll find that a fair number of people have no idea. So if you take home off and don't make it easy, uh, then they can get lost. Fat fingers rule. Um, there, there is an awful lot of older people, and people, particularly if they haven't got fine motor control, trying to make things work, and it doesn't work that well. Um, scrolling does work fine. Uh, everyone's an expert. You, every person will tell you, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm fine on my mobile phone, so I'm really good. Um, and the number of people who close their phone down and switch it off and just can't figure out how to get to what's the browser again. Um, so just be aware of that one. Final takeaways from me. Um, the biggest one for me is ethics. Be aware you have an ethical responsibility to that person. You need to make sure they're okay. Um, now, it won't be a problem for most of you, but some of you it will, and some days it will, and it will just pop up out of nowhere. You need to make sure that person's all right. You need to follow up with them afterwards and just make sure everything is good. But also about their privacy. You don't want the videos and the recordings to be spread out and appearing in places where they shouldn't. Be a good facilitator. It's not an easy skill. It looks easy. If you watch a good facilitator working, it looks like they're sitting there and not saying much, and just kind of every now and then you know, just, just reading something and, and working with the participant and having fun, it is a hellishly hard job to do. Um, but um, try to be a good facilitator and practice if you can. Look for actions, not opinions, and patterns and the why of why people do things. Um, and just one last example I want to give you, and it's a great example of this. I was working with a health site recently where a fair number of people that we researched said the site is good, not great, but it's good, but it needs more content. It needs more content. It's good, it's about a particular health topic, uh, it, it, but it just needs a lot more content. And that's what we heard time and time again. The problem was not that the site needed more content. Once we actually started looking at the patterns of what was happening, the, the problem was 
there was a set of links on the right hand side that looked like related links uh, and there was a huge amount of content in those links and people saw them but they saw them as they were just other sort of places I can go and have a look. They didn't understand that the core remit of this site was to give you an overview and then lead you into those links but because they were on the right hand side they thought they're not key. So they just kind of dismissed them and said, yeah, yeah, no, you need a lot more content. So the problem was not more content. That's what we heard time and time again. The problem was the visibility and the, and the conceptual understanding of what that content was. So that's why I'm saying look for the why, because otherwise you end up building a lot more content you don't need. And I think I hit time. as perfect timing as I've ever had. So thanks for that, Gary. Uh, we have some time for questions, and I also have some um, prizes for questions. So uh, can I ask a I, question? Sorry? I can ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, anyway, uh, so when we had the uh, Slack workshop, we had um, the Slack app UI guidelines, and I had some spares printed up. So... Where's our first question? There we go. You would have to be in the corner, wouldn't you? <laughs> there Thanks, Gary. That was really inspiring. Oh, I just want to ask you what kind of the worst questions you should avoid asking from anywhere? Um, the worst questions, so uh, leading questions are the, the worst. So questions, that, so questions like, um, tell me what you like most about this page makes people tell you, they'll pick something. They'll just go, oh yeah, that thing, oh yeah, that's, that's great. So you're getting an answer that is completely false. That's the first. Um, the next one are questions that, that carry with it some kind of weight. So questions like, was, you know, did you understand that this does this? Because it's, you're suggesting to the person that, you, I know you're stupid, um, but you know, can you just tell me why? Um, so questions like that start to add judgment. Uh, they're, they're probably the second. Um, but, uh, and also questions that carry bias with them. So if you're, if you're presenting knowledge to the person or you're showing a preference for something, then you're putting bias in. I was going to say, keep using the mic. Oh, wow. No, you're near. <laughs> hey, Gary, thanks. Hey. Um, a couple of tips from you around the drastically need to get stakeholders to hear what's going on. Because as a researcher, you often find yourself being emotively drawn to the, the function of doing research. What are your top three tips for being able to ensure that the people who are buying your skill get in front of the information that you're being able to get out of people? Okay. So, um, I guess it's probably a bit easier for me in one sense because I'm, uh, I run an external research company, so they tend to come to us and because they pay dollars for it, they kind of want to see it. Um, but the, the top tip for me is um, probably about showing the, the evidence in video form because it's very easy to say people don't like something or people were confused by something. And the, it's, it's an old... Um, that thought process, but it still abides today, which is like, well, yeah, but it was just a couple of stupid people, right? So most, most people would have got that. But there is nothing more powerful than showing the evidence to someone and seeing them watch. But even better than that, really, is getting them to attend. So that's why um, uh, places like City Group Rooms are good, because they can come, they can watch, they can observe. And most people very quickly become an advocate of this approach and understand, more importantly, because a lot of it isn't so much about understanding the importance of the research, but it's having empathy with people because their perception is people are here and, and then they walk in the room and say, oh, actually, they're, they're not, and we, we've let them down. And most people are decent people. Um, and once they see that gap, they, they very quickly understand we have to put this right. Um, I've had the odd person who falls out of that category, but mostly they fall into it. Yeah, I love... Um going in to, uh, in, into a stakeholder meeting where I've got the, um, where I've got three videos of people hating something that the CEO wanted, demanded had to be in there. And it was the best day of my life. <laughs> uh, thanks, really great tips there. Um, you talked about not having, not surveying users, just, just trying to probe. Do you have any thoughts about including a short survey once you've done that at probing at the end, like the system 
utility scale or some sort of a yep. part of a little bit of a metric? Sure, absolutely. So um, the, when I said program server, I didn't mean don't ask those types of questions because they're absolutely useful. Um, but the, when you want to understand how someone's using something, that's where I, you should be probing them. So um, the worst thing you can do is get someone to go through a process and then say, rate that out of 10. That, you see, you don't get the right information. Um, system usability scale, you tend to find a, quite a false positive in one way because everybody says, yeah, it's great, yeah, it's fine, yeah, I'd, yeah, I'd recommend it, yeah, it's, it's wonderful. Um, uh, same with um, a net promoter score, you tend to get a bit of a false positive, it's generally high. Um, but they can still be quite useful, particularly if you do research over time. So you can start looking at how does that waver, how does it go up and how does it go down, and then break it into the segments. Um, so um, the, uh, I don't want to plug it, but the tool we use uh, uh, breaks it into segments so you can start looking at well, how do different audiences rate that. So it can be quite useful, even though statistically speaking the numbers you're talking about are pretty small, it's indicative of what people think. Um, and it, it can also be useful to, in, to marry up with other research. So if you've got um, some of the um, quants research, if you've got stats, if you've got the market research department, for example, or, or marketing has done some kind of um, segmentation and they've got wider stats and you've gone through analytics and looked at how people behave, you can start looking at, well, if we, you know, if we, look at, if we extrapolate the four people who identified in this way with those questions to the behavior of the people we see on the site, that's, co uh, that's costing us 200,000 a year. Um, so it can be really useful to include those types of connection between the research to do that. Thank you. Thanks. Hey Gary, fantastic presentation by the way. Um, just sort of the, probably the extreme of what you've been talking about, but how do you um, convince or what's your techniques for you know, anyone that's sort of in research or been chosen for you know, research that might be sort of a little bit hampered by their position? You know, say you might have people that you've chosen as, as users and you see their value and you know, as you said, they, they're sort of basically um, in a position where they're going to be prospective users, uh, but they might not be further up the food chain, so they might just be you know, people you really want them to use, but they're answerable to say their manager or their CEO or whatever. How do you, any techniques there for like how you can sort of unfeather their feedback? So do I, I'm not sure I understood the question. Do you mean for the, the people that you want to research are uh, not freed for the research? Or you mean if you're a researcher? And no, you're... sorry, your users. Yeah, so you're the researcher, right? Uh, but you'll probably want you know, um, the users to be the real people using it, not the managers and the CEOs and all those kind of people that yep. want the marketing side of it. You really want the sort of people that are going to be at the forefront of the usability. Yep. Um, they're not always, they don't always feel sort of like unfettered to give their feedback. Is there any techniques there? Well, the, so you're absolutely right in the sense that the people who should be in the room are the people who use it. So a, a great example of that is if you look at um, large scale um, HR systems and software apps where you've got uh, somebody at the CTO is making a you know, multi-million dollar um, decision to purchase and the poor schlobs down the line there somewhere are just forced to use it. Um, I had somebody complaining about that with Salesforce just, just today. Um, so. The, 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 what you have to do is identify who those people are, first of all, and that generally is something which you, you may have to uncover, or the marketing department will know that, usually. So they can tell you, look, that, that's the guy that buys, these are the guys that support it, and these are the people who use it. Um, the, one of the biggest um, tricks that i found is to identify the pain points internally around that, because um, uh, there was a good example where I worked with um, a telco, I won't say who it was, who had a, a support system that was, uh, there was a high level decision made to make it the same support system for external customers and internal support staff. Uh, and it works great for customers, it works horrendously for support staff, and they hated it so much um, that they wouldn't use it. So um, we had to find the pain point, and the pain point was, once we spoke to these people, we realized what was going on, they were writing, they would go through the system, find the answer, write it on a piece of paper or a post-it, stick it in their cubicle, and because they weren't allowed to do that, they'd hide all the post-its at the end of the day and walk out with it. And, but the information was then out of date, so they were then giving customers the wrong information because it had actually changed online. Um, so the pain point was actually in the metric of their customer satisfaction that was going down. So it, quite often it's about identifying where is the pain point, because the person up high 
will have a pain point somewhere. It will impact on them to some level, and that is your in to say this process has to change. Because if they don't feel that pain, then they'll just go, why should I bother? It's going to keep going. Uh, one last one here. Um, so you obviously research areas that have quite serious topics or quite serious subject matter. How do you and your team kind of define the line of where you go with your research, especially with interviewing and observation? How do you sort of know where you can and can't go and set that at a systemic level across everyone, not just on a case-by-case -case or yep. your own judgments and basis? Yep. So um, there are um, there are research guidelines. So we're members of the uh, AMSRS, for example, and there are guidelines in there around um, the ethics of good research and, and when and how it can be done. So that's that's our baseline. Um, on top of that, um, there's the Gary meter, which says, um, you know, no, we're not so. Uh, for example, not that we ever have, but if we ever got approached by a tobacco company, for example, or that you know they'd be getting a two-finger salute, not a not, not a project. So. Um, there, there are certainly areas that we w would refuse it. My, my own uh, thermometer for this is around whether this is for the benefit of the people that we are researching or for a monetary value or some other purpose, because that's, that, that for me is the absolute acid test, that it doesn't benefit the people that we're trying to help here, then we won't, we won't work on it. Um, thank you. I know there's lots more questions, but we are short on time. So everyone, uh, please join me in thanking Gary Bunker.